Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see so many people here today. How are you feeling? I didn't hear you. Oh, that's really good. It's great to see everybody here today. And welcome to the Let's Make Change Happen conference together. I'm Rachel, and I'm your host for today. And today, we have a day filled with fantastic speakers, great poets, performers, and some fantastic workshops, which you'll all be attending later. So, I know that everybody likes to use the internet, so I'm gonna give you the internet information. If you need to use the Wi-Fi, the code is guest, and the password is spring, and it's all lowercase, but it's also on your delegate packs, okay? Um, access to the toilets, if you, you can go through these doors here, where you came and you registered this morning, there are toilets at the back there. And also to your left, there's male toilets here. And on Acre Road, it's also a um, wheelchair accessibility point. We have fire exits here and here. If you hear the fire alarm, please try not panic. Just walk closely outside and you can get through Acre Road entrance as well. Refreshments I can see everybody's got. They will be served throughout the day. Okay, so you're welcome to go up and down to get your refreshments. Um, pastries were delicious this morning. Did everybody have a pastry? <clears throat> I didn't because I want to stay in my dress, so I didn't have a pastry this morning. Okay. Lunch is also going to be served outside where you got breakfast from this morning as well. And lunch, we should be breaking for lunch around about 12 o'clock. We are going to be doing some filming today, so if there's anybody that doesn't want to be filmed, if you could just let um, one of our Flex staff know, they're wearing the black t-shirts. So, can you just put your hand up for me? There's one of the Flex people there. And we also have some activities that will be available for everybody that wanting to do breath work. This session will be taught by Josh. Is Josh here? Okay, so this session will be taught by Josh. Aisha, are you here? Yeah. Relaxation session will be taught by Alicia. But no, no problem, because in the break, I will explain that to you again. But before we start today, and I know they're not in the room, but I really want to say thank you to Flex for making this day very special for the Four Fitting Lies team and for everybody here today. So thank you, Flex. So can everyone just put their hands together for Flex? And hopefully they can hear outside the room. So as I said before, we will be running workshops before and after lunch. And Flex staff, who the, the gentleman that you saw at the back, will be in the black T-shirts. They will be on hand to help you, direct you to your workshops. And today... We, we're hoping to finish the conference around about 4.40 p.m. So, are you ready to begin? I said, are you ready to begin? Yes. I think we can do better than that. Are you ready to start the day? Yes. So now, I'm going to introduce you to Dai, who is our program manager for the Four Finning Lies team. So let's give Diane a round of applause and welcome her to the stage. I'm not sure how to follow that introduction, to be fair. Um, thank you so much for joining us today at our final for Finn Lives Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham conference. Throughout today, you will hear about the work we've been doing and why. And you will hear the real life experiences from the people in our communities whose needs are still not being met. You will be offered practical tools and tips and you can all, you, all use to change your part of the system to better meet the people experiencing multiple disadvantage. And we hope what you hear will inspire you to continue our work beyond the end of this programme. As many of you know, Fulfilling Lives, Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham is part of the National Fulfilling Lives Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. 
This has been a £112 million investment dedicated to improving access to services for people experiencing interconnected needs such as mental ill health, homelessness, drug and alcohol use, interactions with the criminal justice system and those who often experience multiple disadvantage. Our goal at Fulfilling Lives has always been to make a difference for the people we serve share our learning, sh shaping practice and policy, both locally and nationally, to influence long-term systemic change. And whilst our programme ends in June, we wanted to take this opportunity to share our learning with you, because you are the people who can make a real difference in the parts of the system you affect. And with increasing inequalities and relational and economic poverty, it is even more important to bring humanity and compassion it back into the system and it's at the core of our message today we want to focus on relationships and make a difference in people's lives not only for the person experiencing the system but also for you working in the system we will share practical tools and tips that you that have worked for us and we would talk about the mistakes that we've made along the way so that you can learn from our lessons and build on them we would emphasize the importance of relationships we will emphasise the importance of listening to and acting with at a support level, at a team level, organisational and system level, with the ambition that you will be inspired to know that you and I can apply the learning today in whatever part of the system we are experiencing and influencing. And I hope you recognise and hear a shift in a mindset and a continued challenge to the traditional status quo. In the last conference, we outlined key concepts of both co-production and system thinking, sharing the learning from the research and learning partnership. Do not worry if you miss this, and thank you for those that have returned, because um, it's on YouTube, much to my satisfaction, less to my teenage daughters. Um, throughout today, our workshops and our amazing keynote speakers and panel members would talk about the importance of the relationships and centering the person experiencing the system at the heart of system change. And we see ourselves as hopeful disruptors, pushing change in the system, and I hope what you hear and learn today will inspire you to recognise that we all have a part to make, play to make a change happen together. So over the 20 minutes, and I've got Lola, giving me um, eyes, um, I would like to share the learning, leading to the key changes we would like to see happen in the system, so then we can better support people who are experiencing multiple disadvantages. This is our evidence from the people we have walked alongside throughout the journey, and it's based on real life experiences in our communities. So for now, I'd like to focus our minds on five learnings, and anyone was here before, it's always in fives, that have shaped our recommendations. The power of language, how we change the language we use to change the lens we see people through. A person-led approach, the need to commission a person-led approach for those in our communities and unmet need, with unmet needs. A learning culture and how we can work together to bring down silos in our working and learning to change the system as a whole. Co-production, centering the person at the heart of the system change that we do and how these have and can lead to a new way of system thinking that delivers system change that breaks down silos in our system. It's the power of language, it starts with you. By changing the language we use, we change the lens we see through. And people we have supported have for all, at some point, been labelled as hard to reach or as having multiple and complex needs. And often a person can't access the system, or they must access the system at several points. And often this will be at crisis point, labelling them as multiple and complex needs. If people make it into the system, they must conform to a set of requirements, and often they've had to present at multiple points within the system, presenting at one service for one need and another service for a different reason. And often they have found that hard and withdrawn and the labelled as hard to engage. And the onus is being placed on a person to create several relationships, to build trust on demand, particularly at critical transition points. And they might have been signposted to new relationships and often expected to retell their story over and over and over again and start the whole relational process again. 
And if they weren't able to, do, to, to be able to or choose not to do that, they're then the labelled hard to engage. So often people we expected to walk in a linear, time-limited line. And if a person relapses, if they are sent to the beginning of a service, and must start a cycle all over again. And they must do this knowing that it did not work in the first place. So when really all they often want is a sense of belonging and a place of safety. And they step away from the system with their unmet needs and they are then labelled hard to reach. So I'm sure you can all be familiar with these, these labels. And I'm here to share with you that if you want to change the cycle, system change starts with us. If you want to be more trauma responsive and demonstrate cultural humility, we need to focus on ourselves first. And the easiest, most accessible way of doing that is by starting with the language we speak. As the language we speak informs the lens we see through. And as Wayne Dreyer says, if we change the way we look at things, the things that we look at change. At Fulfilling Lives, we started to do that. We challenged ourselves and then started an inquiry that has been the bedrock of our learning. We believed and we challenged, and importantly, now we've evidenced that it's not, ha not the person that is hard to reach or hard to engage or has multiple and complex needs. It's a system that is hard to access, hard to navigate through, and particularly at times of transition, and is complex with multiple access points. So by questioning the deficit-based language, we have questioned and in turn identified how that affects how we behave in the system. And these labels and many others are indirectly blaming and shaming the very people who have unmet needs, placing the onus on a person with unmet needs to do the changing, rather than on us who are in the system. So how about we flip the narrative and focus on how we, you and I, can change the system so it's easier to access, easier to connect with and travel through. And through the language we use, we have the power to make the system more accessible. So next, next learning was the need to commission person-led related approaches. Over the last eight years, we have tested different approaches. And at the heart of those that were successful is when we have focused on relational support. Focusing on building trust and relational support reduces the need for multiple access points, lengthy assessments, and mitigates against the cliff edges experienced when traveling through the system. A focus on repairing and restoring relationships has been for the person and the surrounding team reducing compassionate fatigue in the system. We have developed trusted relationships based on the person's strengths and resources and their goals rather than needs and problems. And rather than a linear pathway where people often get stuck or fall out of it, we have travelled alongside a person, navigating through the system and its complexity and only accessing traditional services as and when needed. So we've surrounded the person and their trusted relationship with a network of support around the relationship through reflective practice to support the relationships around the person. And this also provides an opportunity to really identify in real time the system behaviour, providing an opportunity to explore and change how the system is behaving with others. So we've repeatedly heard from the people we've walked alongside, it's a person they connected with that they trusted, that they made the difference in their lives. A person who builds trust and an ability to meet them where they are at, listened to them and acted with them. And this approach has brought humanity and compassion through relational support back into the system. So however, this approach requires investment. It requires flexibility and importantly, it requires time. And person-led approaches work outside of the traditional structures. And practitioners need the time and flexibility to invest in the relationships being creative with how they walk alongside a person to meet their goals. And this type of relational support and investment is importantly less damaging to the person and importantly less costly to the system. So a person-led approach requires us to challenge the traditional status quo of measuring traditional hard outcomes and try new ones and outcomes that are focused on relational ones and measured in that way. The other big learning in film lives was we have created a culture of learning and as a result, created an informed approach to exploring what it's like to be trauma-responsive, gender-informed towards cultural humility. 
We've learned different approaches, and where it works, we've shared that with others, and we're continuing to learn. Investing in a learning culture takes time. Creating equity in both a lived and learned experience means we've had to adapt and adjust to ensure that well-being is considered at all times for our learning journey. In the words of John Dewey, I love quotes, um, the greatest learning is in the reflection, and we've tested different types of reflection, reflective practices to see what works for us and how we can then introduce that to a wider multidisciplinary team with different priorities and concerns. We've demonstrated the impact of cross-system work and learning, creating much valued reflective space for others in what is often a traumatising system. No longer should we in adult services learn just from one another, and likewise for those who work with children and young people. If we learn that way, we work in that way. And if we work in that way, we create cliff edges and misses opportunities. So creating a learning culture is creating an informed, pro, informed environment, one that sits with curiosity and is worth our own blind spots and has compassion acknowledges and appreciates our differences in experiences and perspectives and acknowledges our own biases and assumptions. It builds on what works and embraces a more relational approach. It also gives us all the permission to not just be re reactive but also, also reflective and join across systems to do that learning together, both with lived and learned experience. And as you know, at the heart of Fulfilling Lives, co-production is at the heart of Fulfilling Lives. Centering the person, experiencing the system at the heart of system change is integral. And working in a co-produced way takes time to create equity so that those with lived and learned experiences participate equally. Having a blended workforce so that so that both lived and learned experience informs the daily actions we've done in the program was a start. We have further developed this with a development program for those entering the workplace of our amazing ambassadors and champions, some of, some of which are here today. So tendering for research and learning partnership that brought together through a collaboration of academic and system thinkers and lived experience was vital in centering co-production in the heart of research and evaluation. And we've led, we've had to compassionately challenge the power structures, both internally and externally, to be curious about what is at play, and importantly, take responsibility to act, which can be hard, I'm not saying it's not, it can be uncomfortable, particularly if you hold a position of influence and or privilege. And for those who may not be able to be in that space, or who we need to earn their trust, we have taken responsibility to reach into parts of our communities with care, to honour their voices and experiences. And we've done this most recently with young people at risk of community exploitation and harm in Southwark. So we can truly understand a person's needs, taking the time to reach into them and exploring tools to create and readdress the power balance is essential and particularly for those who experience specific needs and additional barriers due to inequalities and systemic oppression. We've demonstrated this in the work we've done with women who experience additional barriers to the treatment in, in drug and alcohol treatment, and especially women with minoritized cultural identities who often have their needs unmet and require greater depth of understanding. We cannot, cannot expect women to continue to fit into a system often designed for a predominantly male-dominated group. And rather, what we need to do is co-design a new one that meets their needs. And we acknowledge we cannot fully understand and appreciate the experience of others in the system. I and mean, if we want to create long-term system change, we need to centre the person with the lived experience of the system at the heart of what we do, alongside others. And to do this means we need to invest in people so that we can create equity in the spaces where decision making is made across all parts of our system. We have amazing organisations and strong diverse communities and we need to strengthen the co-production networks across our boroughs and align with national movements like the National Expert Citizen Groups. Centering the person experiencing multiple disadvantage at the heart of the system creates long-term change. 
So, nearly comes to the end. Today is where all, all this learning has led us to at Fulfilling Lives. And we embrace a new way of thinking about the system, which requires a new mindset to evidence how we influence system change. System thinking leads to system change. It's not an abstract thing. It's a way of thinking, of deconstructing our socially predetermined views and questioning the root causes of our thinking. And it starts with you and I. If you want to see change, we need to be the change we want to see. And we've demonstrated through our learning of the need for a whole system approach. And we have shared system change tools along the way to help explore root causes and mindsets. An understanding of the systemic lens we bring and how we need to break down the silos in our working and learning together. And as you've learned, the system is not a thing, it's made up of you and me and of people that can make the change that is needed. Our learning has led to five core recommendations. System change starts with you and I. One of our first steps is the power of language, as the lens we see through. If you change the way you look at things, you look at things, things change. And we can all do that today. We, we would like to see commission person-led approaches and relational support. And with that, if we are measuring outcomes, let them be relational ones, not traditional hard outcomes and bring back the humanity and compassion back into the system. Our informed approaches that considers trauma, gender, and culture requires us to co-design new approaches. And we need to stop trying to fit into a system already designed for the majority. Co-production needs to be invested in. It needs to be embedded across all levels of the system. And we need to strengthen the existing networks and community groups locally and nationally to stay connected to the real-time experience. And system thinking strategies across boroughs and shared learning programmes offering that space for us all to reflect, break down silos and therefore barriers and creates opportunities to change. So we see ourselves as hopeful disruptors, pushing change in the system, and I hope what you hear throughout today and learn today will inspire you to recognise our work does not end here. It does not end with the end of this programme. Rather, it continues with all of us here today and our, our allies outside this room. And we ask that all of us play a part to pay to let's make change happen together. <laughs>